it's Ivy Slater, and you're listening to Her Success Story Podcast, a show where gutsy businesswomen share their success journey. Hi, it's Ivy Slater, and welcome to today's Slater Success Live. So for those of you who are watching us live on LinkedIn or Facebook or YouTube, thank you for joining me here. Also, because this is a special series we're doing, you're going to be able to also listen to it on Her Success Story, our podcast. So those listeners who are coming in at Her Success Story, thank you for joining us here today. You are all getting an amazing treat. Um, when we start this, what I refer to as our nonprofit series, we do this from the week of Thanksgiving through the week of New Year's. Um, and it's our time to highlight leaders in the nonprofit social impact space, leaders who are doing amazing things. And I have to tell you, this is our fifth year. This is our fifth year. And every time we do this big announcement in September, who should we be interviewing? Who should we meet? What should we know? The community comes out big and strong, and I'm able to connect with amazing people. So let me tell you about Donna Cryer. Donna Cryer is the CEO of the Global Liver Institute. She received a life-saving liver transplant in law school after years of living with an autoimmune disease. On the 20th anniversary of her transplant, she realized her expertise as a patient, lawyer, and professional health systems consultant can help fellow patients and in 2014, she founded the Global Liver Institute. So for those of you who know anybody who has been navigating a autoimmune disease, who's navigated any problems with liver disease or any problems with anything medical, meeting Donna is an amazing opportunity to learn from a woman who's a mover and shaker and doesn't sit back lightly. Donna, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be here. So you started the Global Liver Institute in 2014, and I, I read the highlight of it, but let's get the real story. You know, what, what was the catapult or the catalyst that said, it's time I'm doing this? Honestly, I tried very hard not to. Um, <laughs> I was taking stock on the 20th anniversary of my liver transplant and looking around and trying to be honest with myself. Was I confident that other patients coming behind me who were in the same circumstances as, as my family and I were, would they have same access to the innovations in medicines and surgery and care that saved my life then? and frankly, sustain me today? And, and the answer was no, because most people have never uh, heard about anybody with liver disease, or they think they don't know anybody who has had a transplant, um, who has gone through the series of issues that I had had. And there was certainly insufficient uh, advocacy and attention for us. And so um, I, made the decision that uh, I guess that's what I was going to devote my life to, or at least this portion of it. So, you know, you, you, when did the liver issues start in your life? When I was in eighth grade, I was, I was 13 years old, probably earlier, actually. I was, um, you know, when your best friend is the school nurse, something is probably wrong. <laughs> Ding dong, there's yeah, a problem. Yeah, so Nurse Deedle and I were close, we were tight, and uh, God bless her. And so um, I always had, you know, tummy problems. And so uh, uh, when I was on spring break in eighth grade, um, I wasn't able to eat. I wasn't able to drink anything. I was rapidly losing weight. And um, I was admitted to the hospital and I was diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease in, in the hospital. And um, in some ways, it was a relief to finally know what was going on for, for many what, patients. What was going on, what the real, what, what yeah. that, that it wasn't some mm -hmm. little, you know, a, a child going into the nurse saying, my tummy hurt, my tummy hurt, my tummy hurt. Right. But this was a real disease, a real disease that um, 
they knew even at that point, uh, the trajectory was that I could develop colon cancer, um, that I may need a liver transplant. Uh, they, they didn't know, but every avenue ended in something quite dire. Um, and so it was very serious. Um, and it weighed on, on my parents as much as or more than me at that point, certainly. I just was missing softball practice and wanted to get back to school. So, it, you know, you were very fortunate as a child to your parents navigated the health, the health system, for lack of yeah. a better word, right? You went on to college. You went on to law school. Mm -hmm. You built a pretty dynamic career. You weren't a lawyer for a day and walked away. Let's let's <laughs> a little bit about let's a little uh, because it it shows. I, I I want our viewers, our listeners, mm -hmm. to hear the fortitude that you showed up with when you started building out the Global Liver Institute. I was uh, in law school by the time my uh, autoimmune disease got so uh, you know life threatening that I, I needed to have my, my colon removed and then the liver transplant. So I took a semester off um, and then I went back to law school. Um, I'd already graduated from, from Harvard and had you know, very kind and accommodating you know, roommates who knew sometimes I would have up days and down days. But I graduated from Harvard, had gotten into Georgetown Law and- uh, A rather got, accomplished woman. Yeah, I was I, I was doing okay. Um, you know, it's uh, I I have an amazing class. I need to give a shout out for the women of my uh, Harvard class of '92. We uh, now uh, have within our ranks uh, Governor Mara Healey of Massachusetts, the common great Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We have uh, Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Ooh. Brown Jackson. So uh, cl Harvard class of '92 is not doing too shabby. So I, I a I, group of young women at the time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and the men are okay, but the women uh, of the class are doing really well. So when I look at my accomplishments in, in, in that light, I, I'm still trying to put in extra work. I'm, I'm still trying to, you know, we have standards. So um, the fact that I took a semester off and returned to law school seemed like the only right thing to do. I was recruited into the Justice Department for some groundbreaking work I had done in applying law to an internet environment. Um, I was telling a bit of my age because um, it was new at the time. And so I worked in the criminal division uh, at Maine Justice in, in the Department of Justice. And um, that was really my my dream job. And, and I was... Um, you know, my, my team teases, they're like, oh, if you have to find out she was a federal prosecutor, the discussion is not going in the right direction. <laughs> um, so that does come out from time to time. But I had uh, stayed, of course, in such close contact with my liver transplant team mm -hmm. and had observed in my many, many days, weeks, months in the hospital that perhaps things could be done better in the transplant system and in, and in healthcare overall. And so, um, they introduced me to the United Network for Organ Sharing, and we created a, a job for me that was one part. And there are going to be a lot of parts here, so so don't doubt my math on this. So I'm not saying halves, but one part, one part. Uh, We're not going to go into the deep weeds of the numbers. We're just yes. going to look at sections. Sections, yes, right. Sections, so, sections. <laughs> it was one part federal affairs. It was one part communications. It was one part supporting the general counsel. It was one part... Um, supporting the patient education team. It was a great learning experience and it was also a wonderful way for me to give back and to, to make sense of my own experience going through transplant and to plant the seed of wanting to do more for others. But it also taught me that, hmm, this healthcare thing, always have a career. There are no end of problems here in healthcare. So, uh, very true. <laughs> so after four years, um, there, I went on to a series of, of jobs in, um, in oncology, uh, revenue capture management. So running, you know, cancer practices and talking to hospital CEOs, um, and chief, chief nursing officers and, uh, ended up at a global public relations firm and helped rebuild that practice and then built a multicultural division of a clinical trial recruitment firm. So, wow. by, the, so by the time I uh, was thinking about what I could bring to the 
field of hepatology, the field of liver disease advocacy or liver health advocacy, as we now like to think about it. Um, I, I had a lot of skills. Um, it makes sense in retrospect is what I say about my career, but I really just was following my path and passions and my curiosity and, and opportunities um, as, as they came along. And I, and I just want to do a shout out because I think it's important for all viewers mm -hmm. and listeners to be aware exactly what Donna's saying here. She followed the path of passion and curiosity. So often when we are looking at the younger generations and they're thinking, what should I do? Follow your passion, follow mm -hmm. your curiosity and trust. And, you know, it sounds to me that you trusted that process and did great work while you were there. That when and, the and that's the point. Came. Yeah. And that's the point. You have to do great work while you're there. It was really important for me, I think doubly important, because I still was living with a chronic illness and, yeah. and had ups and down, you know, days that I had to be more than excellent. Um, I, I felt to sort of make up for sometimes, you know, Donna needed to go to a doctor's appointment or Donna needed to take a week and, and go to the hospital. I wasn't quite as stable as I, as I am now. And so I talked to a lot of, of young women in particular who have, um, chronic illnesses uh, and are wondering, you know, do I disclose it to my boss? Can I have a career? How do I have the conversation? And I say, well, you, you do have the conversation, but it's much easier to have the conversation when you have a portfolio of excellence um, and of consistently excellent performance to be able to balance your health issues with. And I think that's important. I think no matter what we take on, we show up at 100%, mm -hmm. right. with 100% commitment, and we show mm -hmm. up at 100%. And then where there are any courtesies that are needed. Right. I think that's why I, I uh, remember distinctly there was a coalition that we were putting together. Okay. And I was so instrumental to it that when I needed to take a, you know, a doctor enforced two week break. Uh, I was thinking they'll have it all sewn up by the time I get back, I'm going to miss out. They just held it. They were like, well, we were just waiting until you came back. And so two weeks later, there was not a change to the PowerPoint. There was not another person recruited. They were just sort of like waiting, waiting for me to- Because they me valued- because I, was, I was just that valuable. Whether they valued me or not, I was just that valuable. Uh, it right. was making such a difference to the clients, to the relationships of the people we were bringing in, to the words and the language that we were using, to the knowledge and substance of the project that they really had no choice but to wait until I came back. And so uh, make yourself just that valuable. Um, make yourself not, just that valuable. That's that's what we refer to as a writer downer. Make yeah. yourself just that valuable. Mm -hmm. Yes. So 20 years, 20 year anniversary, the light bulb goes off. Mm -hmm. The Share light bulb went bit. off because I had also, I, I had tried to volunteer with other organizations. I, I had tried to sort of, you know, help around the edges, you know, um, write a check, volunteer on a committee, um, nudge something along, you know, plant a seed, do an idea. And there really just wasn't an organization that I felt had the urgency of the patient needs that I was seeing and had the, the business acumen to, to scale, to uh, be at the level of, you know, the other nonprofit organizations that I, you know, love and admire and have the opportunity to 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 work with um that i had consulted uh for uh for for a time um and so i was like why should with patients with these sets of conditions because there are more than 100 types of liver disease but all of these conditions why should they suffer because there isn't effective advocacy and, and so it was really only after doing that really deep dive and understanding the landscape and looking under every, you know, rock and, and leaf and trying other avenues that I, that I really had to come to terms with the face that if it was going to be built, I was going to have to be the one to build it. So let me, I have so many questions, Donna. <laughs> 
So let's let me start here for a second. Mm -hmm. Okay. You and I've had conversations, and one of the things is, wow, starting a nonprofit isn't for the faint of heart. Starting a nonprofit is not a hobby. Right. You know, you you are CEO, you right? Mm -hmm. That that yeah. is woman in charge, chief executive officer. Mm -hmm. Um it's so easy to just say, oh, this is such a good cause. We'll raise some money. We'll do some good. Mm -hmm. You didn't approach it like that. You really approached it as a business. And it's not easy to start a business. It's not easy to start any organization, let alone one that you are truly emotionally tied to. Absolutely. And I had to take a step back, frankly, from the type of liver disease that personally affected me and really be thoughtful about what were the greatest needs in the field. What diseases had the highest prevalence, had the highest economic impact? Um, what would be early proof points of an effective organization? And so the Global Liver Institute uh, is organized around councils, um, which do take advantage of my experience building coalitions. Um, and we have councils in liver cancer, in fatty liver disease or NASH, and pediatric and rare liver disease, which is the type of liver disease I have. But that's not where I started because it was more about how do we build a sustainable advocacy infrastructure for the field, one that can identify problems and array people around them and set an agenda to solve those problems based not just on the skills that I have or that I may hire for, but the skills that the entire field possesses. And, and so that was a very different approach. Um, I We have a lot of organizations who convene now with us who have um, taken a more traditional approach, which I absolutely respect and which has been effective in, uh, you know, raising funds, whether it's from, you know, bake sales, walks, galas, golf outings for, for research. And they may work with, you know, one, uh, one institution, one researcher, particularly if it's a rare disease. Um, and they have, and they are making a, a difference. I can help them make a bigger difference um, by uniting them, by helping them uh, solve problems that affect, that I see affect many organizations um, like them uh, and uh, connecting them to, to resources um, that they might not otherwise know. And so for the Global Liver Institute, our, our success is less about a, a program or initiative that, that we do, but has the field as a whole um, advanced? Is there is there more research dollars overall for liver diseases? Are, um, are we more powerful on the Hill or in a regulatory environment? Not for my disease, but for the field as, as a whole. And that means bringing along the physicians um, and the payers and, and other stakeholders at the same table. Um, we weren't quite accustomed to patients sitting at the heads of those tables. But um, now right. they appreciate and, and so one of the things I so admire about your organization, it's it has this patient first centricity, right? Mm -hmm. It's patient patient first centric, right? And as much as all the research is important in the labs and the studies and in the science, there's so much to learn and help from learning from the patient's point of view. Absolutely. And, um, you know, the heart of our organization, certainly my heart, is um, our Advanced Advocacy Academy. And so training other patients and caregivers to sit in all these spots that I have been privileged enough to, uh, to, to sit in now or roles that in many cases I've been the first, but hopefully will not be the last. Um, and that they know that they're not just there warming a seat. Um, yeah. I may have said, may have said at one point that we're training assassins. People were like, what, is, what does that mean? I was like, I want them to be the most dangerous person in the room. Nobody will ever think the patient is the most dangerous person in the room. I know I am. I want them to be the best equipped. I want them to have the best ideas. I want them to have the uh, knowledge, uh, 
substance, the, the methods, the approach to be the most effective person in whatever room they sit in. Um, so it's beyond just knowing that they belong in there, knowing that they can make a contribution. I want them to be the best person in the room. Um, so to have a very strong seat at every table. Yes. I remember during my first uh, FDA advisory committee meeting, when it started, the physician sitting next to me turned to me and said, I don't even know why you're here. At the which was so kind. I'm sorry. I couldn't, so I couldn't hold back the emotion. I, I, I couldn't know, hold back I the face. <laughs> so kind. So kind. So welcoming. So open. And uh, by the end of it, he was like, can you come up to my center? <laughs> can you, he was like, can you do all the things? Can you? We were, we were partners. He wanted, he was on team patient. Um, and so I love those transformative moments. I, I love, uh, you know, going from being, um, you know, my, my team now, uh, you know, quotes this sort of scene from Ted Lasso where he talks about being underestimated while he shoots darts right at the center. And that's Correct. what it is to be a, a patient, um, you know, in all of these situations throughout healthcare, whether it's in the board of the hospital, or I said, or an FDA advisory committee meeting, or reviewing grants, nobody thinks much of you. You know, nobody thinks uh, or thought much of this patient advocacy organization that I had built until they realized that I could shut it all down and they couldn't move without me. So now we can have patient-centered conversations not where patient is like at the center like we're a target of things but we we're the whole uh exercise of whatever we are doing whether it's in research or or care or in policy is organized around what do the patients need as we define it as we are sitting there with the other stakeholders defining it and and so that's when it becomes exciting because otherwise who is healthcare for if not for the patient well the and incentives have haven't said, been yeah. you know if we don't look at the patients why is there right it's it right. is it it is about the patient it's the power, the health of the patient the wellness of the patient their life they're moving forward and then what the healthcare to, system can do to support that right and it's not for publications and it's not for profit, although we have both. Um, and, yeah. uh, and I understand both. Um, and so uh, one of the wisest well, things- It goes that back to what you said earlier of there being segments. Right. And we need all the segments, mm -hmm. but kind of like the patients get a double segment. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And I think it's important maybe even a triple, <laughs> maybe a triple. Well, we get we get the veto power. We get the first yeah. and the last word. Um, but I think and it's a weighty responsibility. And I think we need to be worthy of it and prepared either with understanding how to convey the strategic nature of our lived experience. So strategic storytelling um, to learning, uh, you know, methods. And so our Advanced Advocacy Academy is less about me imposing what I think, you know, GLI wants someone to learn. And it's certainly not about, you know, pimping people's stories to roll them up on the hill. It's really about matching what were the pain points in your journey. Uh, and that becomes my to-do list. Th those pain points become uh, matched with your professional expertise or your passion. And uh, how can we equip you to address what you found troubling the most within the system? So whether that's a hospital issue or uh, an organ procurement organization issue around organ donation or a cancer center right. flow and structure issue or navigation issue or a health insurance issue. Uh, and how can we equip more patients who have our conditions to be able to address those. And so when I think about the 200 people who now see the ecosystem, um, who have come through our program, you know, that's my legacy and, and, and that's my power. I'm in the 
business of, of growing people. I'm in the so, business of growing advocates. So let's, let's talk about this for a moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. You are currently in three countries. We have, three offices. Three offices. we have offices in three countries. We you have, have offices in three countries. Yeah. We have partnerships in more than 70. So how are you doing this? Okay. So let's talk about, you know, nonprofits. Yes. Let, let's be real. Viewers, listeners, let's be real. Nonprofits are business. And the best, most successful nonprofits are run as businesses. Yes. Okay. Yes. So we have the urgency. How are you accomplishing this? We accomplish, uh, we measure things. So we measure mm -hmm. impact. You know, we have goals. Metrics is what I'm we, hearing. We use metrics. We use data. Um, this isn't about, you know, hearts and flowers and, and trying your best. Um, we have, um, you know, team meetings. We have strategic retreats. We have, we think about, uh, you know, the year, the month, the, the week, the day, even in terms of optimizing our own performance as, as, as individuals, um, as part of the team, as part of departments, as part of, um, now the larger organization, I think very, um, deeply about making sure that everybody who is a member of the organization knows how their work um, feeds in to the larger work and mission of the organization and how their work impacts patients and families, even if they haven't been a patient themselves. And we do have many patients or, or family members um, within the staff as we do on our, on our board. But uh, it, it, even for those who don't, how can we make sure that they know and see and feel um, how their work is impacting uh, people? So that's that's an important part of growing a a culture, a culture that transcends global growth, um, creating a GLI culture that can be transmitted as we grow, that can be transmitted remotely, that can, can be transmitted and translated into the multiple languages now that our team speaks. Um, and so that is more of what my job is these days than you know the nitty gritty of you know writing a program or a proposal, but making sure that every member of the team understands what GLI means to them, what it can mean to people and and know that they are are part of that growth so the future okay where well, we have a few minutes left yeah what is vision? and we're coming to you know end of year we have strategic planning going on we have visioning for you know one three mm -hmm. five ten years your vision where you see this going next our vision is to be um closer to communities uh, we launched our Center for Liver Health Equity um, this year, which really just pulled together all of the work that we were already doing to make sure that uh, liver health and liver services were accessible to everyone. Um, and so in 2023, the best way to help us is to be able to help us um, build capacity so that we can be serving local communities better. You know, we can give small grants, for example, to do a town hall in Cameroon that has already changed how they've been able to negotiate about um, hepatitis B drug and make that more available in their community. And, and That's so, a big deal. yes. And so we can do so much with so little that has uh, an impact for so many of the 1.5 billion people who are living with uh, a, a liver disease. And so, that's what I'm excited about, that how much we've already grown, how many people we've already touched um, in the number of languages that we've touched them, you know, and we can do so much more. Um, and so that's that's what I'm excited about for next year. And I'm just going to say, I'm just, you know, a regular person. <laughs> As my mother would say, that's true. I'm yes. just, thank you. Just a regular kind of person, right? And mm -hmm. I can think in our conversation, three people I know who have, who ha or have some sort of liver di disease. 
Yeah. So when it's that easy and just our conversation from me mm-hmm. saying, oh, in this one, oh, in this one, oh, in this one, different right. areas, different situations. And probably that's the tip of the iceberg of the people I know. Right, right. And even if they don't have liver disease, they have a liver. And so their liver health right. is important and we want to keep them from ever having a liver disease. And so, you know, we have, um, we are working with uh, parents, pregnant people, infants uh, with liver diseases, grandparents, it really is everybody. And so our liver health is public health. Um, I, I think I'll know that we are successful when conversations like this about liver health are as normal as having conversations about heart health um, or brain health. And that's what you talk about around the Thanksgiving, uh, you know, table. And uh, so, that's that's where we want to go. So if there's one tip you can give our listeners and viewers today. Um, the tip is to, uh, I think, do, do what you just did. Recognize that there's probably some, raise the issue. Raise the issue. Ask the question. Has anybody had, you know, a problem with, with, their, with their liver? And, and then listen. And then connect them to, to us. Um, that's that that's really it I, you know it's amazing the number of people who see my liver lady license plate or 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 hear over a conversation about liver i've had conversations in parking garages and you know in the cvs aisle everybody it's it, it doesn't have to be the secret let the secret right. out let the let secret, the secret out, out. Let's, <laughs> let's let's talk about our liver health yeah as a proactive approach yes I love that. Well, Donna, thank you for joining me here today on Slater Success Live and her success story. And most importantly, happy Thanksgiving. A lot of gratitude to you for coming on during vacation. I'm grateful for every day of the 11,000 some since my transplant. I'm certainly grateful for Thanksgiving and and thankful for you and this platform, the crossover episodes of any superhero or always the best episodes anyways. So (laughs) So, listeners and viewers, here's a couple of tips coming in. Okay. This is getting posted on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on YouTube. Let us know what was most important to you? What, what resonated? What your takeaway was? And then take that breath and say, what can you do about it? It just takes one small action that makes a difference. So make a difference today. Donna, thank you again for joining me and wishing you and your family a wonderful holiday season. Thank you. <laughs> And viewers, stay tuned next week on December 1st. We are interviewing Michael Osa from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. You know, interestingly enough, I know a few people with that too. We all know people with things. This season is about reaching out, making a difference. Education is a way to make an impact. When you learn something, share it forward. I appreciate you for sharing these episodes forward. See you next time.